Now I gotta fix it. How? By going walkabout. You just leave everything and you start walking. I mean, the Foundation adopted the idea from the Aborigines back on Earth. The theory is, if you separate it from yourself, you start walking and you keep walking until you meet yourself. Then you sit down and you have a long talk. Talk about everything that you've learned, everything that uh, you felt, and you talk until you run out of words. Now that's vital, because the real important things can't be said. And then, if you're lucky, you look up, and there's just you. Maybe you can go home. It's a strange thing, but every sentient race has its own version of these Swedish meatballs. I suspect it's one of those great universal mysteries which will either never be explained, which would drive you mad if you ever learned the truth. Because <laughs> if Babylon 5 falls, we all fall with it. We are all Kosh. Sheridan is about to wage a desperate battle. He knows we're here. Deep inside, his enemy's mind. If you're gonna do something, do it. No. On an all-new Babylon 5. You have transmissions holding. Match incoming signal. Full audio and video decode. Purple files accessed. What you are about to see has never been shown to anyone outside the break house. there in podcast land welcome to gray 17 a babylon 5 podcast a part of the front row network and npr illinois community voices we are a group of first ones who are watching for the umpteenth time and newbies who are watching for the very first time and we are here today to discuss one of the last episodes of season three walkabout i'm scott and with me is blake jesse emily kevin mike justin and Nicole. Before we get started talking about Walkabout, please be sure to like, subscribe, follow. I still know only about half of you are subscribed. We actually had our biggest week ever and our biggest day ever last week with War Without End. So hopefully some of you are brand new to us after that last episode. But again, make sure you click that subscribe button. Along with that, you can find all our social media links. We're active in Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, kind of threads. And you can check all that out and join those conversations. And if you want to get involved in the bigger discussion, we have our Patreon Discord, which is open to anyone who joins our Patreon. And a big thank you to our Gray Council members, those who have donated the largest amount and are our producers. They are listed in the show notes below. We have a review that Jake came in as well, which is also huge for us. Those reviews really absolutely help the show grow. So thank you so much for that. And I'm vamping as I pull the review up. This review comes in from Still Electric. Still Electric says... Hold on, is uh, a power I, tool company following us? I'm uh, Still Electric, yes. They say, fantastic for pouchlings and veterans. The mix of perspectives on this podcast is excellent. I love hearing the analysis from the first ones. First ones? Ha ha ha. Alongside the reactions and insights from the hosts who haven't seen the show before. Including the voices of people new to sci-fi is brilliant. It's, a fr it's refreshing to hear what people are who aren't familiar with a lot of the tropes think of them. Highly recommend for both first-time viewers and those of us who have been watching since UPN. So if you can, please go to Apple and leave us a review. That's actually the last one we got in. So if you want to keep us re reading your reviews, you got to send them in. Let's go ahead, guys, and talk about Walkabout. And Nicole, I think you have a synopsis for us. I do. A familiar face returns to Babylon 5, as well as the arrival of the new Vorlon ambassador. Sheridan addresses the War Council to test a theory and goes for it. Garibaldi and Jakar have a slight disagreement, and Dr. Franklin is on a mission to find himself, but instead he finds a lady. Dr. Franklin's on a mission to find sobriety and a lady. God, this is going to be a fun episode. It's a lady. Yeah. <laughs> 
I was going to do that. It's he find a lady. <laughs> <laughs> Yay. Okay, guys, let's go into first impressions from our newbies first. And let's go to Emily first. First impressions on Walkabout. I didn't hate it. <laughs> Jesus, here it comes. <laughs> so she also didn't no... hate War Without End. I'm just throwing it out there. Uh, there was no Zathras, so that was a nice mental break from the clicking. Oh, <laughs> clicking. Um, and then Garibaldi just bit into an unpeeled orange. Like, what the hell is wrong with you, you unhinged bastard? Did anyone <laughs> catch that? Like, I lost all train of thought when I saw him do that. I'm like, that's it. I can't. I, it's Nope. It's gone off the rails. <laughs> um, but it was nice to see Dr. Franklin come back, and he looks like he's doing better. So, yeah, I didn't hate it, except for Garibaldi and the orange bit. That's going to haunt my dreams forever. Jesse, what will haunt your dreams? The fact that Franklin is extremely problematic in every fucking episode he's in. I'll tell you, I, I thoroughly enjoyed the the what, the walk the walkabout. Is it that's what it's called, the walkabout? Um, I thoroughly enjoyed the walkabout concept and it really like kind of spoke to my soul a little bit because I think we've all been at a point in our lives where we're like, all I'm doing is working and I don't feel like I do anything else. And I think I say about a thousand times a day, I need a fucking hobby um, that doesn't include doing things related to my job. So that was that, I, you know, I, I really actually enjoyed that portion of it. The other portion where he was, you know, with the girl, that was not a, uh, it was a little unnecessary, I think, but whatever. Um, overall, I didn't hate it, like Emily said. Um, meh, it's fine. Justin. Yeah, it was watchable. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I guess I enjoyed, me personally, uh, shocker, I enjoyed the A plot a little bit better than the B plot. Um, although the B plot did have some valuable lessons that we'll get into uh, when we talk about that. But the singer, Kaylin, I think... I was looking at her like the entire episode going, I know I've seen her. I know I've seen her. I know I've seen her. I think she was on ER, wasn't she? Or something like that. I don't know. But um, the new Vorline ambassador looks mean for some reason. I kind of get, uh, you know, I, I guess I guess as much as you can call Vorlon's dickheads, he just gives me an extra dickhead vibe. So not even sure what to call him. Kosh 2.0, new Kosh, Kosh Light. Who knows? If you're reading um, the expanded universe, he is uh, Ulkesh. 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 You'll never okay. actually hear him say that on the show, but he's known as Ulkesh. Nah, he's oh, douchey Kosh. Name. I'm a go with Kosh light. But um, so yeah, I mean, I liked it. You know, it was, you know, not as heavy as some of the other episodes we've been dealing with lately, which actually isn't a bad thing. It's kind of nice to hit, take it a little bit lighter every now and then. So it is what it is. Nicole. So this episode was not the greatest, but not the worst. Uh, there were highs and lows, uh, especially after the episode we just watched. That was so intense. Like Justin said, it was kind of nice to get a reprieve and get something that was like, you know, half, you know, value, half kind of like, eh, you know, um, I thought it was really cool to see them test the theory um, about the um telepaths so that was kind of fun um i mean i didn't mind the shirtless franklin again i'm not gonna lie i know jesse thinks he's problematic but yeah. wasn't wasn't complaining about him being shirtless um i do at first i thought that girl was shady shady count um but turns out she's just sick uh, and can't afford her medicine. So, which, you know, I have been there because that's been my life for the last two months. So I thought that um, that storyline was kind of interesting. And honestly, I kind of hope he finds like an actual like person to love because I feel right. like he, he needs that. Like mm -hmm. he needs, so maybe this will become, maybe he can be with her until she dies or whatever, you know? And then uh, let's see, the Jakar and uh, Garibaldi argument, that was pretty, pretty wild. Uh, you know, I think that Garibaldi, being a military man and having that military mindset and coming in hot with Jakar. At first I was like, man, he's going really hard on him. But then I was like, oh, I guess he kind of has a point. Um, but it all worked out in the end. So uh, I, hopefully they will be out of their fight and they'll be friends again because I like their friendship. And uh, I will talk about this later, but I was right about something last week. So we'll we'll talk about that later with the Vorlands. But so, yeah, pretty uh, mediocre episode. Not a terrible one. Not my favorite, but like Justin said, watchable. Great. This is going to be a fun conversation. Let's go to our first ones who have watched the entire series. Mike, first impressions. I didn't hate it. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
like a lot of the others have have said, um, I do find I don't find Franklin necessarily problematic as just very unlovable <laughs> in this episode. <laughs> and uh, so that part of the plot was was kind of uh, not the not the best for me. And we'll talk a little bit more about that and why they insist on inserting these weird semi music things into sitcoms. Um, but uh, the other side of the plot with uh, Jakar and and uh, Jakar and Sheridan is awesome. I really liked it. I really enjoyed it. I really liked the progression of the the story overall. So um, kind of a mixed bag. Kevin, this is one that. I had been kind of looking forward to, and then when I watched it, I was like, eh, you know, I just, the Franklin stuff, for whatever reason, just doesn't hit for me. Um, and that's not anyone's fault, I don't think. It just uh, it just kind of fell short of expectations. It's been a while since I saw this episode, but um, I liked the shadow stuff. I liked, you know, the the stuff with, with Lead Alexander, and I thought the scene with... Uh, Jakar and Garibaldi was quite intense, and I can't wait to talk about that. And the the stuff with Nukash, uh, interesting. But o- overall, um, as much as I wouldn't skip this on a rewatch, it's it's not a favorite of mine, certainly. Like, so I'll go. With, you know, this is one that I would actually skip on a, if I was just wanting to do a quick rewatch. I may not, you know, stop on this particular episode. It's not bad. I do like the part with the shadows and uh, especially there when uh, Jakar shows up at the end with the rest of the fleet and that that piece of it I really like. The this the Franklin stuff is not really something I care that much about at this point honestly even though I do like the character of Franklin, I just don't get invested in this particular part of the storyline. So, I guess I don't hate it if that follows the theme of everybody else. <laughs> yeah, uh this falls into what many mid-level to mediocre Babylon 5 episodes do, and that is the B plot is much more interesting and important than the A plot. Uh, I mean, if you're a Franklin fan or a fan of that character arc, this is a good step for you. But really what we're looking for and what I'm getting out of this is the continual movement of the Shadow War. And now that we've got the ability to, we kind of knew this was happening with Ship of Tears, but now we've got the ability to actually fight back and... We've got the League of Non-Aligned Worlds actually backing the play of Sheridan much more and backing Shakar much more too. So I think that the B plot is much more important to me than the A plot. So let's go ahead and dive into the conversation in total. Blake, what do you got? Well, just one thing, just listening to our thoughts on this episode and talking production order, because we've touched on this many times, there is umpteen orders of this show. And originally, the plan was this episode was going to be before War Without End, one and two, but that would have split War Without End across sweep. So you would have had it part one, hiatus, and then picked up on part two. So they adjusted the schedule, bumped this to after War Without End so that you could have that first. So I kind of wonder, an episode like this coming off such a major episode with like War Without End, if that doesn't maybe impact the reception to this episode... Whereas if it would have came before, it might have had a different impact um, rather than be kind of a slower episode after that kind of a two-parter. As opposed to having Grace 17 come right after War Without End, which we'll talk about Beyond the Rim, I'm sure. We'll get there later. (laughs) It's that new messaging service for Jesse. (laughs) Hey, we're going to talk about that episode episode in total next week. Let's wait. Let's wait. Uh, Justin, what do you got for Walkabout? (laughs) Oh, is that what we're talking about tonight? Okay. The first question I had was actually at the very beginning. Speaking of walkabouts, Sheridan just decides to go for a stroll on the outer hull. And when the Borlon ship is arriving, it makes a dead stop, pulls up to Sheridan's level, and then just riding comes across the side of the ship. Do we ever find out what the hell that is? Justin, you're going to be excited to know that JMS actually answered that in, on the internet back in the 90s, and I feel I can give you the answer without spoiling anything. According to JMS himself, the writing on the ship is, welcome to Hawaii. Oh, your fly is unzipped. <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay. Welcome to Hawaii. <laughs> cool story, bro. And then JMS um, has asked if he knew what it actually said, and he's like, I only know a few terms in Borlon, like, where's the bathroom? So that's all he's got. Yeah. Do you know where the library is? 
Um, <laughs> Donde was, yeah, was Donde was. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, in, in the the scene, and I, I know we brought this up on several occasions over the course of uh, specifically this season. Um, just the shift in dynamic between the relationships of Garibaldi, Londo, and Jakar. Um, throughout this entire episode where at the beginning that exchange where Garibaldi and Londo were close friends and Garibaldi's done with them basically said, uh, what was the whole problem when, when, um, when Londo was making the complaint about having the Narn vessel there and Garibaldi, you know, is saying, look, look, we're going to protect him, deal with it. And he goes, well, what kind of guarantee can you give me that, you know, that they won't attack us or anything like that? It's the same guarantee that they won't come in your quarters and cut your throat in your sleep. You not, you didn't make me any such promise. I know. But I so if that was just, yeah, that was just, it's just a whole shift in dynamic between now the relationship now is kind of just completely turned on its head 180 degrees. And I just, I, I, I like seeing that just keep continuing over and over and over to where, you know, Londo due to his own actions, no longer has any friends left on the station. Really? Well, I'll go one step further on with that, Justin. We saw this exact same interaction between Garibaldi and Londo back in season two and Londo made the wrong choice. When mm-hmm. Garibaldi and Jakar had the same conversation this episode, Jakar makes the right choice. So Correct. It just shows again that Londo has no friends because Londo keeps making the wrong goddamn decisions and Jakar keeps making the right decisions. When Garibaldi told Jakar to get your shit together, he listened. Yeah. He got his shit together. And got a lot so. of ships together too. Yay. Kevin, what do you got? I, this is the first time that I remember feeling truly angry at Londo. Like before, I'm just always, you know, disappointed in him, you know. But this time I was like, dude, fuck you, man. You didn't go out of your way to, you know, do anything to uh, save the Narn or do anything else. So why the fuck do you think you deserve anything in the, at this point? Like, you're just complete asshole for even even making the suggestion that you deserve something out of that. And I'm really glad Garibaldi put him in his place because he absolutely deserved it. Blake. So, Kevin, after everything Londo's done, this is the point where you got I know. to fuck you? I know. It, just, it was just the audacity of the suggestion to say, you know, hey, what, what kind of guarantee? None. What kind of guarantee did you give anyone else for not stabbing them in the back? Like, fuck off, dude. I just, I love the trajectory we are with Londo and the, just the, he drops asteroids on <laughs> Narn. Man, Londo had a bad day. <laughs> <laughs> now we're like, fuck Londo. <laughs> fuck him, Nicole. Well, another thing I thought of too, when Kevin said that was, you know, the Centauri made a treaty with Earth, but B5 is not necessarily following that anymore because they're not in alliance with Earth anymore. So that treaty doesn't mean shit on Babylon 5, technically. So Lando really doesn't have anything to to expect because they don't owe him shit, especially now they're not following that treaty if they're not part of Earth. So just kind of was like, oh, damn, Lando, you done fucked up, son. Anybody else? Not to mention, didn't the Centauri cruisers actually open fire on B5 when they, yeah. When yeah. they came yeah. last time? So, I mean, yeah. you know, fuck off. And we, That's my point. It's just the, the utter audacity of him. <laughs> In that in that moment, like, yeah, okay, I probably should have been mad at him before now. I'll 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 cop to that. But you know, up until this point, I was just kind of, you know, really disappointed in, in him. But man, fuck off, dude. I'm, I'm still it's, waiting for somebody on this podcast to be like, Yeah, but then like old Lando, he's in there and he's gonna come through. <laughs> <laughs> That's usually Justin's line. He's still in there. <laughs> but this is another one of those where a little not it wasn't really little, but a, a plot point that you never thought would come back came back. That Narn ship that was protected a season ago is now the Narn ship that came and saved the White Star's ass. It's just little stuff that this show does so well, and it's that's why rewatches are so much fun. Justin, it makes me happy to know that Swedish meatballs exist all over the galaxy. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. Me so too. I gotta tell you, this has been the biggest comment in the past week on youtube and that is let's talk about swedish meatballs so we got to have a conversation here a little bit just you're going to love this part we got to have a conversation what are your theories on why swedish meatballs 
are a thing across the galaxy. The easiest food in the world to make, pretty much. Yeah, everybody this loves meatballs. meatballs. Yeah, yeah take love meat. a meatball. Delicious. Yeah. No now, vegetarians are, in this group, including me. When the Vorlons now, appeared to everyone, they showed them the glory of the meatball. That's one of the <laughs> theories online. One of the theories is when Vorlons were socially engineering everybody, they also said, here's our favorite dish. And so it is a meatball. Theory. You want to know another theory? And again, hey, hey, folks, I'm not going to spoil anything, so don't yell at me on the chat, okay? Don't yell at me. Uh, yell at him anyway. I, I thought the most popular thing in the chat the last week was telling you to quit spoiling That's things. That's what. Movies. I didn't see anything about me. Which, by the way, I stand behind the fact that everything I said is in the show and nothing is spoiled, but whatever. Hi, Tim on Twitter. Hi. <laughs> the other theory is Jeffrey Sinclair was a fan of Swedish meatballs and therefore spread the wealth. Oh. But I don't think that happens in a thousand years. So I'm not a big fan of that theory. I'm more of a fan of Emily's theory. And that's the, the Vorlons gave us the glory that is Swedish meatballs. So so did the Are Vorlons they... seed every planet with horses then? <laughs> What kind of Swedish meatballs are you eating? Well, the ones from Ikea. <laughs> I have never had a Swedish meatball. <laughs> have you ever had oars? No. That you know of. They're so I mean, good with the lingonberry sauce. I say that like it's a bad thing, but horse is like a regular part of diets. So it yeah. Never yeah. There's nothing wrong various with countries. It. There's nothing wrong with it. Meat, <laughs> meat is meat. <laughs> Mike, we're American. We don't eat horse here. <laughs> Not often. <laughs> Not that we know. No, of. I can't. No, but some I of those bugs a, out of the ground. What's that them, line so. from the West Wing? West Wing fans. Well, I, there's a seven meat soup, and I'm trying to figure out the seven meats. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> don't, don't, just don't try. <laughs> no, but I'm sure if you wanted to swing through the southern U.S., they could probably add a few to the mix. To our friends in southern United States, we love you. <laughs> That's what I was going to say, man. Some some of us like to dig bugs out of the ground and fucking boil them. So I don't. <laughs> <laughs> Someone tried to offer me venison yesterday, and I said no. Oh, venison's good. Oh, venison's that's good. good. Yeah. Deer jerky eat. is really good. I don't like like I don't like venison and like my dad makes it chili. I'm not a big fan, but you know, and you know, a really good speaking of southern parts of the United States, really good meat is alligator meat. Yeah. Oh yeah. It's I've heard that, but I've never tried it. Good. Hard to find up here in some places. Blake, we need another cooking with Blake to do. We've already got spoo. Now we need to do Swedish meatballs. No, I have looked at the recipe for spoo. I am not doing that. <laughs> <laughs> if you that is just wrong if we get uh we gotta do like a challenge if x amount of people do x then blake must make spoo i think you should share with everybody what it is it's yeah, come up. soaked in milk yeah that's <laughs> it's what? Wait, what what is it <laughs> scallops soaked in milk ew <laughs> so it's milk like seafood. i oh, just want to I'll throw like up that. just thinking about that what about flora what <laughs> I said it yet. People eat oysters. Yeah, oysters are pretty right. damn close. <laughs> that's disgusting. They're that's nasty. not milk. That's something entirely different. As someone who had about a dozen and a half of those with some wine for lunch, those are delicious. I, I will <laughs> say, I, I gorged about forty oysters with people in Dude, Louisiana about two. I don't months get ago, it. So. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, mm. they're a little slimy. They look too much like vaginas. <laughs> That's why I eat them. I'm good. I'm going to pass. <laughs> so many comments I'll keep my I can just make myself. about, you know. Oh, yeah. right. Wait a minute. I'll keep my comments to myself. <laughs> so, what else we got, guys? Okay, can we talk about Garibaldi biting into the orange? Did anyone else catch that? <laughs> I didn't. Like, I totally missed it. Terrifying. Because Frank was feeling this. it like a normal fucking human being. Garibaldi's like, jump to peel it. Just, oh. Waste, waste not, what not. <laughs> <laughs> Are we certain? Lots of good vitamin K there. Remember, we we had a whole like plot point, and there's been like discussions on this goddamn show way too many times about how we get fruits and vegetables and everything else to the station, and now these guys are just devouring oranges left and right. And no one's questioning it. No, I wondered about that, but then I got distracted by how we tried to peel it, and my brain shut down from the horror. Just. It's horrific. See, was he really worked up at that moment? I don't know when this happened in the show. I did, when did they not... were sitting down and uh, Garibaldi was talking to Franklin about the walkabout and what he was oh, doing. So it wasn't. It wasn't even like a super intense moment. Because I've done some pretty dumb shit when I was like worked up about nope. something. I've rubbed They're toothpaste nearly into my eyes. And Franklin's <laughs> like, doing a normal like peel and orange. just the like, nose. <laughs> I, I feel you, brother. I feel you. <laughs> no, no, I don't remember the orange thing at all. It, 
his back is to the, the far, camera, so yeah. it's kind of hard to see. But oh, yeah, I caught that. This, this has some like deep psychic impact on you. And you should talk to a therapist about that. Maybe orange is a significant <laughs> somehow. Okay, well, we can start Gray Seventeen Fun for Emily's new therapist when I find one. I like it. You can donate to Patreon. And, <laughs> uh, so we've kind of cracked open the Franklin storyline via oranges. Does anyone want to talk about the good doctor? <laughs> Nicole does. I think Jesse was the one that said the whole story about the walkabout. That was really interesting. And I think that it's kind of cool that he's on like a mission to find himself because we've all got wrapped up and we work too much and don't really know what we're into. So I thought that was kind of a cool. Uh, what was the was it said he, because he's a, a what? Foundationalist. Foundationalist. Yeah. Which actually so, was brought up before. It's this is the yeah. second time he's talked about his religion. So, yeah. So that's kind of like his religious view, I guess. Right. Essentially. Mm-hmm. Yep. So I, I thought that was kind of cool because it's something completely different and like, you know, obviously made up for the show, but also, you know, not your typical like religious thing to be part of. So that was kind of neat. Um, I'm interested to see where it goes with this girl or if it's just a flash in the pan and he never sees her again. Um, but I just really hope that he figures it out and and he seems healthier and he seems better. So hopefully he can stay off the stems and get back to the med lab because, you know, I don't want to see anybody struggling, even if it's on a TV show. So the the little blurb about foundationism is the intent behind the new religion, which started when the Centauri made contact with Earth, was to get back to the roots of all Earth religions, pass the doctrines to the core of each belief system to find out what they have in common and pro- proposes w- uh, that they have a lot more in common than most would have thought. Hence the plucking little pieces of culture from different parts of the Earth. GMS made this religion specifically for the French. Franklin character and he he thought it was nice and eclectic so he he did some background research and just pulled some stuff from a couple of different you know earth religions and kind of threw it together the way that he did and I I, I think it's really cool pretty darn close to the show. Yeah. well I was gonna say and honestly uh, there, foundationalism is a real thing also like in in outside of b5 it is a real belief system in in uh, the world and it's by what i can tell i read up a little bit about it it's uh similar to, to what you just described i don't think jms inadvertently started this religion i think it was already around <laughs> wait we, we discussed l ron hubbard last episode let's not do it again <laughs> <laughs> um so anyway what i was gonna get into with the franklin bit is um you know i i kind of alluded to this in my overview summary thing impression but um you know i don't i didn't have anything any any issues with um (laughs) franklin being problematic and i actually thought the walkabout concept in this episode is is quite thoughtful and kind of thought-provoking and interesting and all that um you know and i will say that my biggest issue is just that i tend to find franklin to be an unlikable character because he is the guy that is absolutely 100 percent, always convinced that he's right about everything he's kind of like what's the word the best way i could describe it is like he's the son that every mother says they want to have <laughs> you know he's he's like kind of a goody two-shoes to the point that you hate him for it and he thinks he can fix everything and and in this episode he plays that character yet again to an absolute t and that he finds this woman he kind of arrogantly says oh you're you're too good for this place. Something is amiss here and I have to fix it and, and figure out what it is. And I just didn't didn't care for it. I didn't find that part of this story overall that compelling in general, but also, you know, it just kind of fed into my not really caring for the Franklin character. He's a lot like the surgeons I've met. I'll, I mean, I'm not trying to throw all surgeons oh, on the bus, but I'm not saying he it fits that absolutely... mold extremely well. Oh yeah, he he may he he fits an archetype that exists in the real world 100, <laughs> percent and those are people that I would not like. I get that. Well, and I mean, it, it, and everything that we see in this episode is so very much Franklin. I mean, you mentioned most of it. He also becomes holier than thou when she asks for the medicine, just assuming that she's trying to get high. Yep. And then when we go to the med bay, how dare you give her the medicine because she's that's what made her OD. Actually, no dumbass. Maybe you should actually look yeah. into this more. Yeah. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's Franklin. All the Everyone way. else in this med staff, I have zero confidence in because they don't make the rash yeah. knee jerk decision or, or judgment that I do. I've been in this room for five minutes and I'm going to yell at Dr. Hobbs immediately because she has no idea what she's doing. Yep. Justin, what do you got? I mean, I get it. I struggle with 
the likability of Franklin. There's sometimes I really want to like him and there's sometimes that I really don't. And this is one of those episodes for me that it's just, I really want to like him um, in this instance because I really want to have sympathy for him because, you know, like we've all been saying, I mean, we, we, we've all been there. It's the age old idiom of stop and smell the roses. You know, I think we all kind of use from a walkabout or more companies and organizations and careers offered sabbaticals now and then I think a lot of us would be better off for it but it's you know I I really think that it's I mean he's he's an arrogant prick that's just the character so whether he's at the same time though he's human and he has a lot of the same flaws and everything maybe even more flaws than the average human uh, depending on people's opinions on the show but at the end of the day, he he just needs to get his life right. And he even acknowledges, I think, based upon his conversations about why he's doing what he's doing, is he doesn't know how who he is without being a doctor. And I think maybe that's a big part of his problem of why he behaves and acts the way he does is being an asshole doctor is all, all he knows how to do. Who is Richard Franklin outside of that? And that's, I think, what he's trying to find out. And maybe if he does end up finding it, we may end up with a very different Dr. Franklin uh, going down the stretch. But, you know, I mean, I, I thought that whole, especially that whole scene, I'm going to interject one second. Emily, I just ran it back. You're 100% right. He does bite the orange. <laughs> but I think he was biting it just to start peeling it. He but was, anyway. but it's still unhinged. Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 I absolutely I, I, judges I, you I based on know. your eating of fruit. Yeah, I had to know. So I fired up the episode real quick. But um, going back to what I was saying, it's I like the whole explanation of the walkabout because it's I, if you know, thinking about it, we all do spend all of us humans in general spend so much of our times with our head down, just trying to mull through everything, trying to mull through our careers and social obligations and all the, you know, superfluities of life that we don't stop to look up and see the stars every now and then we, and then by the time we think to stop and actually take a damn breath, we're too old to do anything. It's we've, 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 we've wasted our entire life on bullshit. And what was it for? So I kind of, you know, this is an episode where I really want to have a lot of sympathy and hope that um, that Dr. Franken will come out better in the end and maybe he'll become a more likable character um, going down the road. But as the great Burgess Meredith once said, you can wish in one hand and crap in the other and see which one's going to get filled first. So uh, we'll just see what happens. Nicole, I think with uh, Franklin, it's like he's got a savior complex, but it's based upon his judgments. You know, so it's like he wants to save people. He wants to help people, but he also makes snap judgments and snap decisions about things before he can really think about it or research it. So I think that's what we see happening here with this girl. Like he assumed she was getting high and he assumed that she was a drug addict, but really she just needed the pain medication, you know, because she couldn't afford it or whatever. So and that's a, a common theme throughout with Franklin is that he gets hell bent on something and he just won't let it go. He's like a dog with a bone, you know, so um, I can see why there would be some dissent with liking his character. Um, but I don't know. I just I have a soft spot for him and not just because he looks hot shirtless. I just, you know, um, I think that he I think that Franklin represents and Garibaldi too a lot of um humanity and, and their flaws. You know, um, both of them kind of display the rough and tumble side or the side that's not perfect and that's not packaged up with a bow of humanity and stuff. You know, they make decisions, they make mistakes, they struggle with real issues, you know. Um, so I think it's necessary to have those kind of characters on the show to kind of show, you know, because Delenn is like this wonderful, amazing being and so kind and beautiful. And then you've got this rough and tumble Garibaldi, you know, so I think they all complement each other really well. I really don't have an issue with his assholiness because I think that just shows the flaws in humanity. Blake, you know, I think those flaws are why I like the Franklin character because you I think about doctors in a lot of other series, particularly Crusher and TNG for Star Trek, almost like the school nurse type mentality. If you went in, something was wrong. She hit you with the medicine and sent you back on your day type thing. But Franklin, you've got almost that arrogance that you see in real world 
uh, and a lot of doctors in the real world. And I think Franklin even spelled it out in season one. Uh, Believers, I believe, uh, was uh, he made that speech about people walk in and want me to play God. I take the authority because that's what the patients want their doctor to do. And so he says, they want me to play God, then I'm going to be God. And that's what Franklin acts like through most of the series up till now. And I just think that adds a little bit of a dimension of you see that in real world medical settings far too often, unfortunately. But for me, that makes the character more in depth and a character that I like a bit more than some of the just the single note, you know, walk in, get your aspirin pat on the head and back to whatever the hell you were doing. Justin. I mean, I've heard people kind of doggy Franklin for assuming that she was a drug addict. But I mean, I'm I'm not going to lie. I thought the same thing. And I think that's kind of what the episode was written for that we were kind of supposed to think that at one point until we kind of got that twist in the med bay, you know, because when when they're laying there and she asks for it and he tells her no, and then she's going through his pockets and steals his, you know, his ID chit and stuff like that. I was scribbling notes in my notebook about that 303 song, Never Trust a Ho, you know, and stuff like that. So I kind of thought the whole same damn thing. So it's... I, I felt like an ass when it turns out that she's actually kind of sick and she just needs it to stave off the pain from this terminal illness. I kind of felt like a jerk, too. So you can send your comments to Grey 17 podcast <laughs> at gmail.com. <laughs> Nicole, if no one else has any Franklin comments, I'd like to discuss the Vorlons. Well, one thing Amen. I want to one thing I want to pull out of you all as well on the Franklin stuff is how would you feel about this being a musical episode? Any thoughts? Hated like, it. Yeah, this is like a trope that they do, and I called it a sitcom, and I'm going to get hate mail for it. But in in television, they do. Oh, this don't all worry, the time. Justin's going to get all the hate mail this week. <laughs> <laughs> well, they, there's oh. always these episodes where you like the characters walk in, and there's a bar, and there's a person singing, and I'm like, did this person like know somebody that like they were trying to make their career start here on Babylon Five? Like, <laughs> Was it a producer's girlfriend or something? Like, I don't know. I just hate it. Every time I see it, I hate it. I'm like, why are we doing this again? <laughs> well, I wouldn't call it a musical episode per se. <laughs> it's got two. No, not I at mean, all. And if that was actually her singing, she's quite good. But she is but quite say, good. Yeah, she's got a great voice. It just great doesn't voice. belong in my sci fi show, goddammit. <laughs> <laughs> Let's think about it. Somewhere on a station that size, they're going to have a bar and someone's going to be singing in it. At no, least I want the shitty karaoke like we have in this century. I want. But instead, you know, the, the creator of the show writes the songs, which is, I'm sure, where Scott was going with this. Yeah. And. You know, he didn't he didn't let the musical director for the show write the songs. No, no, no. He wrote the lyrics for the songs himself. He did about an hour Fran- a piece. He let he let Frankie the- uh make the music for Yeah, him. yeah, he did. Yeah, he just wrote the lyrics. But it's just interesting to me. I mean, they're not bad. I I you know, and she she does have a great voice. Um, but and 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 as an aside, there's really gonna be need to be that long of an antenna. In this century, really? Are you sure? That's the thing we're going to pick on. (laughs) (laughs) I didn't think the songs were bad, honestly. I I couldn't understand the lyrics over the sound of my groaning. (laughs) (laughs) Mike, get off my lawn. Let's add gatekeeping to our Gray 17 bingo card for tonight. (laughs) Oh, we've been doing that for a while, sir. (laughs) Emily, what do you got? Yeah, I thought the musical part of it was strange she's talented but something about it just felt off and i couldn't quite pinpoint it i couldn't figure out if it was the song choice the outfits if it was too stereotype like 90s jazz club i yeah it was why am i watching in the music video in middle of my tv program (laughs) a little bit yeah yeah, it was like GMS a bad said he was, one video. GMS said he was going for a Billie Holiday kind of thing, which is interesting. Cool. <laughs> well, that missed, I feel if bad. If that's what he was going for, that missed the barn. That's like, what he said. Yikes. Yeah, I just felt like she was more talented than those scenes actually 
allowed her to demonstrate. Nicole. Yeah, it was funny because when I was watching it, I was like, oh, she's got a great voice. And I'm like, these lyrics are weird. <laughs> like <laughs> Both songs. I was like, what the fuck kind of lyrics are these? You could tell they were made up and they like made no sense. So I think it's kind of funny that JMS wrote them because I was like, what the fuck? Who wrote these songs? So I thought they were kind of weird and kind of comical, but she did have well, a great were- voice. They weren't much weirder than her dialogue to Franklin when she sat down at the table with him after that, that whole thing about his laser beam eyes. Yeah, she was a little hippy dippy, but maybe that's what he what he needs. I, I can see your soul through my cup. <laughs> <laughs> I had dick from it. I was like, what the hell was that? And I was like, oh, yeah, that was a plot point. He, he did mention later that she drinks too much. So that kind of explains it. <laughs> I was going to say, you can see someone's soul if you have a lot to drink, you know, or what you think is their soul. They, they cut out the scene where she tried to fight a cop, I guess. She is dealing with chronic pain, man. It's not fun. Kevin. Yeah, I, I was reading where the director, Krem, Kevin Kremen, was saying that they went through like 30 glasses trying to find the right one for that scene. And I don't I don't know that it necessarily works all that well in the story. Um, it, it, the, the whole thing just is kind of like Nicole said, a little hippy dippy, but. Hey, man, they doubled down with a little fixture he walks by at the very end of the episode. He's splintered. I noticed okay. that, too. I was like, oh, she's finally going to see his soul at the end. <laughs> okay, I, I think we've we've uh, gone down the Franklin train a little too long. So, Nicole, bring us back to Vorlons. Okay, so I want to point out that last week when we were talking, I had mentioned that maybe all of them are Kosh, and you guys gaslit me a little bit, and he literally said, we are all Kosh. Mm-hmm. So, I was right. Well, if you want to believe old cash, yes, you're right. <laughs> just, just the same way Shaka Khan is every woman. Just give it, give this one to me, okay? <laughs> but that's not what I was going to talk about. Um, so what the hell was with him choking Lita out? I mean, he was mad that she let Kosh die, but she wasn't there. So I guess this is more of a question, but was her job to protect him because i was like how the fuck is lita gonna protect kosh a super alien you well, know rem- yeah. remember no we, we've seen this okay so lita has at least once because we watched it happen taken kosh inside of her jesse right. we're all for this and taking him off the station so old kosh kosh 2.0 whatever you want to call him is pissed off that she didn't protect him oh got it <laughs> But and she that's, was why, following, that's why the whole... I'm sorry, I'm going to go ahead. She it, she was following his orders. He told her to leave. Gosh, 2.0 like, doesn't give a shit. He doesn't give a shit about your orders. <laughs> yeah, new Kosh was, was a dick. That was the whole the point. directions of Kosh don't matter, and how the hell would she have known to do otherwise? Well, that's the whole point of the episode, though, is is Kosh still around, and who has Kosh? Because originally, Kosh 2.0, Kosh 2.0 says, asked Lita, I mean, did you protect any of them? Did you save any of them? And she's like, no, I didn't have any of him at the time. And now we're hearing the voice of Kosh. So where is he? Yeah. So Kosh has a Katra. Is that what I'm hearing? It's very Star Trek three. Absolutely. <laughs> oh, see, I thought she the was Horcrux. hallucinating. The Horcrux. <laughs> well, is Kosh and Sheridan because they had that connection in that dream. So that's kind of where I was going. I'm like, ooh, maybe it's Sheridan that's got like a little bit of caution him because when she was speaking to him, she had heard his voice, but it was Sheridan speaking. So that could have just been a coincidence. But I thought maybe Sheridan has a piece of him and doesn't know it. See, now, Nicole, I know for a fact you've never watched Star Trek three, but that is literally what happens in Star Trek. <laughs> oh, I Kirk is no talking. Clue. Kirk walks in the Spock's quarters and he hears Spock's voice and it turns out to be McCoy. <laughs> yep. It literally is Star Trek three. <laughs> Justin, what do you got? Well, and that's one of the things that I was watching with this whole idea of, you know, if a little piece of Kasha's soul survives or whatever the case may be, is that how Vorlon lives so long? They regenerate? That was one of my big questions coming so out of So he's a episode. Time Lord. Okay. Kind of. That's, yeah, like Doctor Who's or a liver. It, it like kind of looks like a TARDIS that they're in, maybe? I don't it know. does. <laughs> it does. And another thing I kind of picked up on is... That suit looks a lot like one of the suits that we saw at the end of War Without End. What else week. does it look like? You saw it two episodes ago. The one who was talking to Sinclair. That's actually him. Oh, I thought it's, so. That is him. I thought so. Again, okay. this is extended universe stuff, but Kosh 2.0 was the ambassador to Minbar 
before he transferred to Babylon 5. I knew it. I fucking knew it. So he New was Kosh on Minbar. Okay. He was, he was working with Sinclair, and he was working with Renan uh, on Minbar. Interesting. In the extended okay. universe, and this again, you can you can add me all you want. This does not come up in the show. In the extended universe, he was the one who helped desi- design the White Star as well, too, because the Vorlons helped to build it. Interesting. Okay. So, yeah, I, just, I, I knew that suit looked familiar. And that's one thing I was kind of curious about with, like, Vor- Vorlon society. Can they and, – and I also mentioned, I think it was another episode, that – with the whole we are group thing about Vorlons is if, you know, when we hear, it wasn't so much when like Tosh 2.0 or all cash or whatever he's called. Um, when he was talking, it was more of a singular voice. Whereas when Kosh would talk, you hold that, you heard that whole cacophony of angels kind of as part of his voice. So is it like, are they, a, are they a hive mind is another thing that I kind of was wondering and picking up with um, throughout this. So definitely a lot more, questions than answers still when it goes when it comes to the Vorlons. Emily. When the new Vorlon ship arrived, did anyone hear something that sounded like a whale? <laughs> That's a different Star Trek movie. <laughs> I know, but I, I was like, was that a whale? <laughs> the things I catch that get me distracted so I miss everything else. If we anyone had, else hears a whale, please let me know. We had Justin and Nicole discussing their notes last time and how long their notes are. Well, we see with Emily's notes, and this is not true because actually you can see Emily's notes on the Patreon, but I can just see like orange and just orange, 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 whale, 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 <laughs> the entire <laughs> note section. Not quite, but I do mention both of those. <laughs> I actually had something relevant to say, but I forgot what it was. So yeah. Excellent. Excellent. <laughs> Nicole. <laughs> So at the end of this episode, when Lita reapproached the Vorlon or whatever, he seemed to, or I call him New Kosh, uh, he seemed to be a little less angry with her. So she told the Medbay people she was Kosh's aide. So is she going to like sync up with this New Kosh or is she kind of like, because I know she went back to, you know, their home world and all that stuff. So <laughs> is she still in with the Vorlons, I guess, is the question. I want it to be known. It's been about an hour into the episode, and finally Nicole has shipped New Kosh with Lee. No, 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 no. I'm not <laughs> shipping them. I'm just curious if, like, she's going to become the new, I'm going to get gills for you kind of, or whatever she was. <laughs> Hold on. I'm going to get gills for you? Yeah, because she had those gills I've heard in some her. slang before, but damn. <laughs> Y'all are sick. Yes. Speaking of sick, Mike, what do you got? Uh... <laughs> we, wow okay feel attacked uh, I, I was just gonna say they made a big deal out of rehashing the whole thing about how you know Kosh, nobody is supposed to know that kosh died and so old cash is going by kosh but like how bad are the vorlons at this because he came in a spaceship that's a different color and has a different suit and he has an ominous glowing red eye <laughs> yeah he with some cool neck bling on his new outfit too, I noticed. <laughs> maybe they're colorblind. Maybe they, they maybe it's the Vorlon thing. I don't know. Do they think everybody is that stupid? <laughs> well, I mean, if um, you've been around yes, for yes, they do. Uh, but you're all. I mean, you look at everybody who has not aged past one million years old and says, "Well, you're a child." Well, it, it, let's be honest. How many things have you know the government went out there and denied when everyone's sitting there going, "Really, you you think we're that you know stupid?" I know they they still fly birds around. <laughs> <laughs> I saw that van yesterday. Right, I meant I meant unarmed government surveillance drones. Birds aren't real. They're dinosaurs. Bird watching goes both ways. God, we're off the rails. Okay, Justin, what do you got? <laughs> I'm still like trying to. I'm still, yeah, no, don't don't come to me for. for we have Sandy. broke Justin. No, I'm still thinking about people gilling people. Um, <laughs> I'm gilling them, giving them gills. Oh, like, uh, so you gave me gilling? some gills. Okay. Baby. So you what gave the me hell gills. is up with the? <laughs> I got gills. They're multiplying. No. No. I was gonna go to shoot the gill, but you know. Oh. No. <laughs> but anyway, what the hell is up with the secrecy surrounding Kosh? Anyway, like the shadows know he's dead. They're the ones that killed him. Is it? Is it? They're they're wanting to hide this from the unaligned world so that they don't create some kind of panic. Do they not want to like? Yeah. Ding dong, you know, God I, I, is dead. I think that's no. really interesting. I mean, 
you've got you've got these gods who i mean yeah. look how look how they were treated in death walker when the vorlon ship just shows up and blows her out of the sky oh there's the vorlons doing vorlon stuff so yeah. if you find out that a vorlon can die and by the way die mysteriously in their quarters that's gonna scare some people yeah, yeah. that's what i always thought it was kind of weird just them trying to maintain the secrecy like yeah but i get it i get it i don't Nicole. remember what the hell else i was gonna say so carry on Gills. Nicole. I just want to point out that I thought it was pretty cool that when Lita at first was, you know, approaching the um, shadow ship, she couldn't really connect or whatever. But once Sheridan touched her and she saw the vision of Kosh dying and him waking up and like Kosh or whatever, she was like pissed off and she was like, burn you bastards. And then she basically fucking paralyzed their asses so they can get shot down. I thought that was a badass moment. I was like, okay, Lita, get it, girl. I'm glad finally somebody brought up that really the moral of this story is do not piss off Lita. Just yeah. don't do it. By the way, did anyone else notice uh, that it seems like Mimbari telepaths? I mean, we also know Lita's P5. So a P5 struggles with these guys. But she also said, I need line of sight. I need to be able to see the shadow vessel. The Mimbari guys are sleeping in the, they're on their beds, just chilling <laughs> yeah. out. Hey, okay, we're yeah. going to do this. Yep. So the Mimbari telepaths are a little stronger <laughs> than yeah. at least the P5. Mike. Oh, uh, maybe a little bit out of place now, but I was going to add, um, you mentioned earlier about how the uh, the Narn warship, you know, having a, appeared in a previous episode, how that was another connection. There was a, there were, I mean, there were probably lots of other connections to previous episodes, but specifically I was going to point out, because Justin just mentioned the non-aligned worlds, that when they were in the war council discussing Sheridan's plan, uh, you, did you notice that a couple of the aliens that were there were the, were the two races that were fighting with mm-hmm. one another a couple yep. episodes ago uh the yeah. guy who very clearly had the uh neil gaiman inspired sandman helmet on he was he was hanging out being part of the plan that's a really good catch like the, yeah they said sharon proved to us you can do this shit and they did so justin when new kosh kosh light kosh 2.0 whatever is walking in new kosh and, on the block yeah what is he uh, uh uh never mind i'm not gonna go there the gill stuff seeing, yeah gills everywhere what is he seeing in the door is he seeing residual energy from the death of kosh because he walks in the door of the quarters and you can see some kind of figures shadows on the door yeah is, did i kind of catch that right where he's seeing like he can kind of see infrared energy or whatever he's going to call it of, you know, this is where Kosh died or this is what happened type thing. It struck me as Pompeii. You ever you know, shined a black light in the hotel room? Same idea. It's like a, Jack, it's like a Jackson Pollock painting. Oh, right. But yeah, I mean, I mean, uh, as we saw on Morden's face during that scene, a lot of energy got dispelled. So, mm. Kevin, yeah. you had something? I was finding myself wishing that Robin Sachs as the... Uh, the Narn war leader had gotten more to do in this episode because I really like that actor, God rest the soul. But um, I just wanted to point out they're, they're still using Chamberlain for the voice of, of Kosh, which as you guys pointed out, you know, it does sound a little bit different. I'm interested to see how that, how that plays out. But uh, the only other, the only other notable uh, guest star in this one um, is, uh, you know, the actress that plays Kaylin, which uh justin was we were texting and he she she was on er her name is erica gimple um i i remember her from being on there too i just remember yeah. when they dropped the helicopter on that one asshole that was a fun scene <laughs> spoiler i'm i'm literally currently binging er i'm on season four episode three and i've started two weeks ago speaking of a surgeon who's an asshole yes the yeah guy, they uh dropped the the uh, oh, helicopter what? on which was not season four, but oops. That's okay. I read ahead. I know a bunch of stuff that happens already. <laughs> oh, here we are again. You didn't say who it was. Oh, I know who it is. I have okay. an idea. I have an idea. You said asshole surgeon. Okay. So anything else you guys want to talk about before we move into questions, predictions? We can, we can spoil shit about other shows all we want, right? <laughs> Soil and green is people. It was all just a dream. The whole thing. <laughs> he got shot, but then showed up again. In it the also show. gets <laughs> shitty after season one. Some of these people are going to be every show. they find out who shot J.R. Ewing. Yeah, well, he wakes up in the shower, so it's fine. Maggie shot Mr. Burns. <laughs> that was a big one back when we wow. were. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, let's move into questions and predictions. 
for those who are joining they us all. for the first time, I'm sorry, but we have uh, the newbies ask any questions they have lingering after watching Walkabout, because again, they have not watched past this episode. And then we'll ask them for any predictions they have about the show moving forward. I already have the from Justin that Vorlons are a hive mind. And I have from Nicole, all Vorlons are one entity. So I've got those already. So let's move around the table and see who has more questions and predictions. Let's go to Nicole first. Questions, predictions. You didn't say me, did you? Sure did. Oh, sorry. My, <laughs> my computer glitched. I didn't hear you. Um, okay. Questions. Are we going to see more of this Kaylin girl? Are her and Franklin going to keep the romance going? Um, are Jakar and Garibaldi going to make up? And are they still going to be friends after this? Uh, especially with what happened at the end and everyone kind of coming to the rescue. I thought that would probably be accurate, but I don't know. Prediction wise, I think that the shadows now know that they have a weapon against them. So I feel like the attack on them is going to come a lot sooner now that the shadows know that they are basically ready to fight, essentially. Jesse, what do you got? My only one would be about Franklin. Um, I guess clearly I'm going to assume this girl, we're not going to see her again. Is that, I guess that's a prediction. And then is he ever going to find somebody that can tolerate him being him? Not on this podcast. <laughs> he's just like, I don't know. It's maybe it would help if he's, I'm not slut shaming here. Okay. So I'm just going to lead with this, but like, maybe it would help if he stopped like sleeping with all of them. The very fucking first hour he met them like I, listen i'm not judging <laughs> but this is a pattern sir so maybe if you like took time to get to know these people okay now that everybody fucking hates me let's move on <laughs> if you're a slut and you feel shamed please find our contact info below and reach out to jesse with your thoughts as i say not, everybody, she's everybody active on facebook me. she's active listen on facebook. be who you want to be i'm not listening Live your best life. You want to do that? Do it. But like he seems to want to find love, but then seems to like find it with the most inappropriate people. Live so, your best life as long as you got Franklin abs, then you can do whatever you want uh, or, or whomever you want. If you look like Jakar in a robe, then I guess you can do whatever you want. Yeah, Jesse, I, I have found this out over the past few weeks that Jesse has a Jakar thing. I, I, you, listen, I never did until I saw him in a robe and then I'm like, hmm. I don't know if I should feel the way I do right now. <laughs> Having strange thoughts. The future panties. Panties. What? The future panties. The underwear oh. they had? Right. <laughs> Emily. No wonder you latched onto the Narncore joke so much. <laughs> She's still the only one who owns that damn shirt. <laughs> yes, I am. Yes, I am. <laughs> Emily, um, questions, predictions. Okay, well, pre this will just be a prediction. Lita will be probing Sheridan to find Kosh. Yeah, she will. Yep, she'll be digging around in there trying to find little bits of Kosh and be creepy about it. But actually, I really only have one question, which is, is the new Kosh even trustworthy? Because he's given me bad vibes. Like, just from the moment the ship showed up, I was like, I don't know about this one. And then he tried to choke Lita and I was just like yikes dude <laughs> not a great way to say hey how's it going <laughs> maybe will, talk about the situation I will say though Kosh 1.0 was kind of a dick to Lita too yeah he was yeah he wasn't great this one just uh, gotcha. god damn Justin, questions, predictions. Kind of my first question kind of piggybacks off of what Emily just said. Are there such a good thing as good Vorlons and bad Vorlons? Like in other races, everybody's got good and evil. There's no reason to think the Vorlons don't have the same thing. So watch out for Kosh Light. He may be a troublemaker. I do think Kosh will, based upon where they've gone in this episode, where Lita has identified a little, you know, nugget of soul within Sheridan somewhere. Um, I do think Kosh will end up getting resurrected somehow. And then for my second prediction, now that we know telepaths are the key to destroying the shadows, we're going to be seeing a whole lot more of Alfred Bester, I believe. Mm -hmm. And we're going to be seeing a whole lot more of Psychor. 
And that's going to add a whole nother filthy dynamic to this whole distorted family that we've got going on in the uh, the war room or whatever, the war council or whatever you want to call it, because they're going to have to give Bester a seat at the table if they want Telepass to be involved in this war. So that's going to be fun. Okay, and that will end it for the newbies for this episode. We're going to jettison them out the airlock in just a minute. And when we come back from our credits, Blake, Kevin, Mike, and I will answer all of these lovely questions and predictions. So next week, we've got an interesting one because our newbies finally get to find out what the hell Gray 17 is, because we'll be watching Gray 17 is missing. An amazing episode you do not want to miss. So until next week, when we do that, I've been Scott, and with me has been Blake, Jesse, Emily, Kevin, Mike, Justin, and Nicole. And remember to click all of the buttons except for the down arrow. Please leave us reviews. And if you can, join us over on Patreon where we do have a general discussion as well as a spoiler discussion going on our Discord. And to mark your calendars now, we're only four episodes after this away from the end of Season 3. So our live Season 3 recap will be October 22nd. And we will have a link on our YouTube channel where you can hit the notify me button so you can be notified when we go live. Again, we'll get that season three um, recap show going. And that means over on Twitter, I'll be doing my bracket tournament for season three as I've done with season one and season two. So follow us on Twitter so you can vote on the bracket tournament and determine what you think the best episode of season three was before the newbies get to pick as well, too. So we will see you next week, maybe, on Gray 17 is Missing. See you, everybody. Bye. We should, Bye. Uh, we should plan and ask me anything about my feelings about Zathras. On <laughs> yes. <laughs> sure. Thank you for listening to Gray 17, a Babylon 5 podcast. You can find all the places to listen to and watch this podcast at anchor.fm slash gray 17 podcast or youtube.com at gray 17 podcast. We want to hear from you, so join the conversation at Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, or Patreon. Be sure to subscribe and leave a review where you are listening to or watching this podcast. Gray 17 is not affiliated with, and the podcast has not been prepared, approved, or licensed by Warner Brothers or any other owners of the Babylon 5 copyright. All clips included in this podcast are the intellectual property of the respective copyright holders. They are included here for purpose of review, and no infringement is intended. The opening and closing themes are available from Falling Matter on YouTube. And what's out there? The rim. And beyond that? The truth. Welcome back to Beyond the Rim. Again, this is a spoiler section, so if you have not watched Plast Walkabout or if you can't remember what the hell happens after Walkabout, you probably shouldn't keep listening. But if not, we're going to go ahead and answer the questions and predictions from our newbies. So guys, let's get into the questions first. And the first ones deal with the Vorlons. And Justin asks us, as he did a few episodes ago, are the Vorlons a hive mind? Maybe. No, no. <laughs> Not not really. I mean, certainly not anywhere close to like a Borg hive mind. No. They they do seem to to share some things on a you know some sort of nonverbal level, but it's pretty clear they're not a hive mind exactly. Yeah, I mean, they expressed in the last episode or a couple episodes ago, I guess it was when Kosh died that that the Vorlons knew that Kosh had died before anybody had like dialed their phone number and told them which seems to indicate that yeah there's some kind of quantum or telepathic connection Mm -hmm. but i don't think that i don't think there's anything that says in the continuity extended or otherwise that they are a hive mind as much as i would as much as i would like to gaslight justin into thinking that they're a suit full of sentient worms uh (laughs) i don't think they are yeah no i I think they're they're energy-based beings who've been around for a long time so yeah i'm sure there's some kind of interconnectivity but it's more of like a a network 1.0 rather than anything else i'm surprised the newbies didn't latch on to what lita said about the vorlons in this episode that you know it's been a long time since one of them Mm -hmm. died they're not handling it well they don't handle change well Mm -hmm. uh i thought they would i thought the newbies would latch on to that and they didn't really talk about it yeah it's true i mean 
as good as spelled it out for Sheridan at least last episode. So maybe they're just kind of satisfied with it. I don't know. Yeah, it could be. Yeah. So next big question is Kosh 2.0 trustworthy? <laughs> no. No, <laughs> Kosh 1.0? <laughs> right. I would, I would say Kosh 1.0 was more, you know, in the end, in riddles rather than being a total dick. Yeah. yeah. Kosh 2.0 is a total dick, which again, I mean, JMS even got called out on it back in the day. They're like, he's got a red eye. Is he evil? I'm like, no, Borlock's like <laughs> different colored eyes. <laughs> like, yeah, no, he's evil he's... touches no, touch your nose. Yeah. Kosh 2.0 shows up with a goatee around his encounter suit, but he's fine. <laughs> Don't worry about it. it cracks, that actually cracks me up because, well, what color was Kosh 1's eye? Blue. Was it blue? Okay. Or greenish that blue. Actually... That does kind of crack me up because that's like the classic, uh, you know, I'm a Transformers fan. So, like, that's the classic telltale in the old uh, original cartoon. It's like if their eyes are red, that means they're a bad robot. <laughs> well, and, you know, his encounter suit's got some purple going on. And, of course, the Centauri have got purple going on and they're they're evil yeah. as fuck. So, well, and moving around those lines, uh, Justin gets a little metaphysical with us and goes, are there really even good and bad Vorlons or are there just Vorlons? <laughs> no, there's definitely good and bad Vorlons, but you don't see very many of them in this series, but you see both sides of it with the two Koshes that you do see. Mm-hmm. When I think Ka- when Kosh started out with us, he was following the normal plan, the Vorlons in the shadows, play this game every few millennia, and we have fun at it, but Kosh made a turn. So that means other Vorlons can make a turn as well, too, or not, depending. So he he decided to break the wheel oh yeah yeah wrong series sorry uh, so. <laughs> okay uh anything else you guys want to talk about with the vorlons questions wise before we move into the franklin side of things nothing not, not cool. at this point i don't think and we still got predictions to go to are we going to see kaylin again nope well, franklin just kept on walking man you got six months left you're fine you're good am i remembering wrong uh, and I probably am because, again, I haven't watched past this episode in a very long time. Do we hear that she passes away? Is there like an off? Is there something like a like a like a, a line just saying that she's gone or no? Am I making that up? I, I mean, thought we got a line. I mean, she doesn't show up again. Right. Yeah, because in Endgame, uh, Dr. Franklin, I just looked it up. Dr. Franklin issues a death certificate in Endgame. Okay, got it. So we do hear about her again. Thank you, Blake, for your speedy Googling. I guess I just wasn't put off by the fact that, you know, you you think that she's going to be, you know, an addict because, I mean, for one, JMS wrote it that way. Like, you're meant to think yeah. that. Yeah. I, and, of course, you know, Franklin obviously is going to think she is because that's the perspective that he's coming from. He's uh-huh. got his own addiction going on. Yeah, so I agree with you, Kevin. Surprising. Yeah, and when I kind of mentioned that in the main episode, I wasn't really put off by it. I was just kind of saying that this is the Franklin we know, and that's the whole point because when he completes his walkabout, that's what his other self will tell him is you're a fucking dick who has a hero complex right. and you need to stop doing that. <laughs> Right. Yeah, I mean, and just to reiterate, yeah, I mean, I, I don't, I didn't say that I had any problem with how anything was portrayed. I just don't, you know, the character to me is unlikable because, it, and it's because he's very well portrayed. He's a well written character that has these flaws. Yeah, you know, and it, and it actually doesn't surprise me that that he does just walk on after finding out that Kalen is an addict because he is kind of strikes me as the sort of guy who looks at someone else and says, Oh, you're flawed. I'm done with you. Even though he has the same flaw. <laughs> well, it's interesting too, because it, it shows you that Richard Biggs had, had some range because everything I've heard about him, he's nothing like the Franklin character, but I, I, I agree. I think that that scene where he meets himself and he, where he, you know, his life is in jeopardy. I think I like that episode for Franklin better. Than I agree. One. Yeah. This is all set up for that. I agree. So, on. Oh, go ahead, Blake. Really thinking about Franklin walking away at the end there is I think that's part of the journey Franklin's on, though, is accepting what he can't fix. It's true. Yeah. He can't fix her. He can't make her better. There's nothing he can do. And he's got to accept that. Yeah. Let her, let her be the person that she is. And she's enjoying herself and living her life the way she wants to live and move along. That's that's a very good observation because the Franklin Agreed. that we've met up until this point would, would doggedly try to solve her medical ailment. Mm-hmm you know just to to his own detriment and 
You know, I think Justin also really made a good observation about Franklin that I hadn't thought of earlier, which is to say that, you know, he's he's kind of the golden boy character, right? He's he's mm-hmm. highly educated. He thinks he's kind of got this God complex going on. But the fact of the matter is sometimes those those people, right, the valedictorian, the, the preacher's kid, they're the ones that have some of the biggest problems. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. and that is Franklin. And I had not really put that together before. Yeah. I hadn't thought of that either, but it's it's spot on. I'm, I'm looking forward to the resolution of this character. I mean, he's going to be here for the entire show, but really the main arc of Franklin is going to come to a conclusion here, as Kevin alluded to, when he speaks to himself. So I'm looking forward to seeing how the, how the newbies take that and how they take that resolution. You actually brought up a really good point, and that was that none of the newbies acted shocked that franklin was back when we had previously heard from them that many of them thought that he would was written off of the show so will franklin find love i don't recall him ever having another (laughs) my joke is he has a great bromance with marcus in season four (laughs) (laughs) yeah (laughs) i think that's as close as he's gonna get and he lives with garibaldi i think at the end of the show no he's just visiting he's just visiting he's playing tennis with garibaldi's kid is that what it is yep yeah, okay. Well, I think he's got a pretty good bromance with Marcus. And then finally, speaking of bromances, are Jakar and Garibaldi going to make up? I'll be fine. Yeah, they'll yeah, be I good. Don't, I don't think they had anything to make up. I think they had a tense conversation, and the fact mm-hmm. that he did the, Jakar did the right thing in the end is all that needed to happen. Well, it's kind of a guy thing, yeah. right? You know, you go up to the guy and say, stop being a douchebag. Okay, yeah. I'll stop being a douchebag. 100%. 100%. <laughs> that, that interaction is a, a lot like to two friends who can actually tell it to each other the way it is instead of having some social niceties and beating around the bush like garibaldi just went after him it's like hey knock it the fuck off and go do it i love the fact that jakar went one step further it was because garibaldi's just like send the fucking darn ship and jakar's like no i'm gonna get a freaking fleet of a new alliance that hasn't been formed yet and show up <laughs> you know and, and i'll say as far as the whole episode structure goes and so many of us i think agreed on the fact that the franklin plot was really lost it, i call it the a plot because it's what the episode was named after <laughs> But to me, the that part of the story was so much more impactful and, and tense because of the basically the idea that Sheridan's plan could fail and Sheridan could die. Yeah. You know, I don't, like the the weight of that versus everything else made everything else kind of pointless. In it's, my it's, mind. it's kind of like TKO, man. We don't give a crap about the fight. We care about it. Yeah. I mean, it's the yeah. same kind of thing. The B plots kind of take over the show. It's kind of funny. If you listen to the trailers for all these, which I put the trailers on every episode before we go into our show, I would say about 90% of the trailers always hit on the B plot and not the A plot. So if you listen to them, it's like this week, the trailer is going to be, you know, Sheridan must go up against the shadows, blah, 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 blah. I'm like, that's not the main yeah, plot. I, but okay. It makes me wonder if this is like an intentional thing that, that JMS was doing is like, trying to be clever but like unlike a lot of his other clever writing tricks i just feel like this doesn't work quite as well maybe mm-hmm. when i mentioned this before but the the only thing i knew about this show before you know blake wanted uh su- kept suggesting that i watch it and i finally did in the 2000s when i was in college was because i watched uh wpwr in chicago and upn eventually Mm -hmm. and all of the babylon five spots were intermixed with other shows that i was watching you know time tracks and others marker Mm -hmm. if anyone remembers marker (laughs) with uh gates mcfadden but um so i've i've seen a lot of these um these spots you know these um you know tv spots for for babylon 5 and that's all i knew about the series in the 90s at all was just those spots and uh maybe one episode that i watched but that gives me a great sense of nostalgia anytime i hear those those um spots that are intermixed with uh, the beginning of the the podcast i love hearing those they also always end with this killer guitar riff every time. It's great. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Okay, let's go ahead and move into predictions now. Uh, kind of going off what Justin was asking, Nicole asks, all or predicts, all Vorlons are one entity. And she's pretty she's pretty dead set on that. She thinks she's right. She's Sorry. not. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. 
but we can let her have her fun for a little bit. The shadows now know that the Army of Light, which I added Army of Light, but that's what they that's what they're referred to, has a weapon, so the attack will come sooner rather than later. Well, first of all, massive spoilers, Scott. I can't believe you said that. Oh, uh, fuck off. <laughs> How dare you, sir? They were called an Army of Light. Well, they were called a Conspiracy of Light first, but yes. Yeah. But actually, yeah, to an extent, but that's why we get Zaha Doom. They, we, before the Shadows get a chance to actually do the final little push, uh, Sheridan takes a nuke <laughs> to Zaha Doom, and so that kind of slows things down a little bit. Yeah, I'm actually a bit surprised uh, nobody latched onto the fact that the Shadows, uh, after the first Shadow Ship was actually brought down, that they were able to respond in en masse so yes. quickly and they were pissed off yes like that four of them just fucking appeared <laughs> you did something bad here we come so i, I do but latch onto that more we didn't talk about lanier at all but i love how bill Mooney throughout the entire episode just assumes everyone's gonna die he's just like yeah we're, we're done i'm gonna do everything <laughs> I can here, but we're, we're done <laughs> and then finally at the end <laughs> lanier puts his uh shoulder his yeah. uh, elbow on the the little stand of the captain's chair he's like we survived and then sheridan does his yep buddy good old pal we did it <laughs> like this oh my god and then he's gonna try to assassinate him later on the real assassination was of lanier's character yeah anyway. exactly. we, we, We'll get there. We'll get there. Yeah. Uh, uh, uh. uh also too i forgot to mention before we get to zaha doom in shadow dancing sheridan also launches a preemptive strike too so there's a couple times where sheridan's gonna try to get the shadows before the shadows get them at least he didn't attack the wrong country oh i'm sorry wah, wah, wah. <laughs> next one kosh will be resurrected after dying for our sins. Not exactly. No. <laughs> he doesn't get the full Spock treatment. No, no. He will help Sheridan be resurrected, though. Yes. Part of the reason why Sheridan is able to be brought back by Lorien is because Lorien says that a little bit sure. of Kosh is still there, fighting to survive. Well, isn't it also, I thought, when they take out Kosh too, doesn't some of the spirit of Kosh leave Sheridan and mm -hmm. in that too? That, I believe I so. I believe so. It's been a while since I watched that episode. It's really fun when we see the real, the true Vorlon form, or at least what El Elkesh's El Kesh's true form is. It's not what we're expecting. No more angels for Justin on that one. So moving on to uh, the telepaths. Now that we know telepaths are important to the war, we kind of already did that, but now we're seeing that they're being used. We're going to see a whole lot more Bester and a whole lot more Psychor. Or Psychor. We don't see... I mean, we're going to see Bester again, but we're not going to see him tons more often than we have already. Yeah, I mean, we're going to start shifting the Bester storyline into the telepath war that we never get to see. Right. So, and we're going to see a whole lot more Psychor and a whole lot more telepaths, but it's going to be, again, it's that, it's, that, it's that story beat that JMS has teased for 30 years and has never really, I mean, except for the books, but ignoring the books for a minute, has never really shown on screen. And that's that telepath war that comes after the five year story of Babylon 5, where Lanier finally fully gets assassinated by blowing yeah, up. Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, it's like, yeah, we do see a lot more telepaths, but it's not in this context. No, we get them in Byron's uh, little uh, fun show in season five. It's I was coming. just thinking if they do end up rebooting Babylon 5 with. Mm -hmm. A multiverse that might allow them to completely fix the horribleness that ends up happening to Lanier. Could be. I was so, I was honestly wondering if Lanier was going to have that happen to him in the road home, but the road home didn't answer anywhere near as many questions as I thought it would, which is okay. But I was expecting more. Does somebody else have something they want to add? Because it's a Gray Seventeen podcast, and we must talk about somebody being probed. <laughs> the next prediction is Lita will be probing Sheridan to find little bits. Of Kosh. Lita will not be probing Sheridan to find Kosh's little bits. Lita will try to po probe Zach Allen, but Zach Allen doesn't play along. But that's another episode. <laughs> I think the person who gets screwed the most in this entire show, just character wise, is Lita because she does everything everyone ever asks her to do. And she points this out later on. She's like, I've done everything you've asked me to. And now you're taking my quarters away. What the fuck? <laughs> poor, poor Lita. And then the prediction, because we love the binary yes and no, we will not see Kalen again. Well, Jesse, they, they finally learned. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Even Nicole, she's like, yeah, she might be a flash in the pan. It's like, yes. Ding, 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 ding. Finally, the flavor of the week does not come back. <laughs> <laughs> 
It only took you three seasons to figure that out. <laughs> oh, it's every episode, man. I wonder if this one character from down below shows up again. Mm, probably not. Probably not. Okay, guys, anything else you want to talk about with Walkabout before we move on to the amazing episode that is Grey 17 is oh Missing, which, by the way, again, same idea. The B plot is so much more important than the A plot it's in that great. episode. I cannot wait to watch their heads explode next week. It's going to be great. <laughs> Nicole, Nicole did predict it, though. I said there was going to be a, a horror icon, and she said Robert England. I couldn't believe right. that she said that specific one and nailed it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but you know what? I mean, I don't know. I guess I'll... I, I was running through this in my head because I actually forgot who it was. And I'm like, what's well, probably Robert England? Because who else is a horror icon of that magnitude? Like, who you actually see his face. Who's yeah. the first one you think of, really? Yeah. Okay. You know? I mean, sure. if it's like Kane Hoarder or Harder, I mean, you don't see him without the mask. So, oh. yeah. But um, they also, there's a little Jigsaw doll in there, too, before Jigsaw was a thing. So, right. Mm. It's, got, it's got a whole bunch of stuff and there's a there's a jabberwocky or whatever the hell they call it it's it's, it's an amazing episode we're looking forward to it mm. yeah <laughs> oh, that, that whole garibaldi thing in that episode it's just god awful the fact that they spend a good two minutes explaining how the elevator is skipping a floor like, <laughs> oh, we're, this is absolutely a filler and oh by the way jms did say the last five episodes uh, are really good and then he, he said if you fall asleep and miss gray 17 is missing you're probably not going to miss much, but the last three episodes are really important. Yeah. Let's get to it. We'll be back next week to discuss Gray 17 is Missing on the Gray 17 podcast. I've been Scott, and with me has been Blake, Kevin, and Mike. Please, again, make sure to click all those buttons. Join us in our Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram conversations, as well as, if you can, join us over on Discord by clicking on our Patreon and joining us over there. And we will see you next week. Oh, and please leave reviews on Apple. We absolutely love those as well, too. They do help the show grow. Thanks, everybody, and we will talk to you next week. Bye.